We're in a buzzing baseball stadium with two teams duking it out. The Futures Victory and the Wannabe Ants are going head to head, and right now, the Ants have the upper hand. You can practically feel the disappointment from the Victory fans. But, hey, there's a saying in the baseball world, the real fun starts when there are two outs in the bottom of the ninth. It ain't over till it's over. And one player is trying to lift his buddy's spirits with that reminder. All this action is happening in the legendary Mayhan Stadium, home to some pretty epic moments. Now, the Futures victory is about to step up for the seventh inning. They've got to keep their heads in the game if they want to make it to the bottom of the ninth. It's all about putting in the effort and giving it your all, no matter what the score is. Now, let's take a little detour from the game. Two fans are sharing a sweet moment, and a photographer snaps a pic. Suddenly, their faces are lighting up the big screen, and the crowd goes wild. There's nothing like a little love to bring everyone together, right? Back to the game, Kuchel Moon from the Futures is up to bat. He swings, he hits, and the bases are loaded. No outs. This could be a game changer. Kihyun Kim is next, and he's feeling, well, a lot. But then, out of nowhere, his partner pulls him into a kiss. It doesn't throw him off, though. In fact, it seems to give him a boost. He steps up, hits a run, and the crowd loses it. Could that be the power of a victory kiss? Next thing you know, the big screen is showing the ants leading 7 to 1. A fan of the Futures team size, saying at least they won't lose by more than 10 points today. It's like people expect them to lose anyway, so she figures as long as it's not a total blowout, she can live with it. But then, she starts to get mad. Is this how it's supposed to be? She tries to keep her cool, reminding herself that it's still early in the season and they've had rough patches before. Plus, they've got some new players this year, so maybe things will turn around. The stadium is hopping with energy and she can't help but skin the crowd, her eyes landing on the wannabe ants fans. And bam! There's this really cute guy right in the middle of them. She wonders if all fans of a winning team look that good. As the game rolls on, there's this insane moment where two players from the same team get booted out because of one hit. She can't help but start cheering, pleading with the players to turn her frown upside down. The Futures defense is kinda sloppy, and with one player out and runners on first and second base, she starts to feel a glimmer of hope for the ants. She's so pumped that she actually climbs up on the barrier, shouting that maybe she should take a swing since the players clearly can't. She even throws in a few choice words, making it clear she doesn't expect them to win every game, just once in a while would be nice. Like maybe on a Sunday? That way, she gets two whole days to bask in the glory, seeing as there are no games on Mondays. But then, the stadium staff swoops in, trying to pull her off the barrier. This causes a bit of a ruckus, catching the attention of the Ants fans who find it hilarious that a Futures fan is literally clinging to the fence. They start laughing and guessing she must be pretty bummed about her team's performance. One of the Ants fans even admits to himself that the Futures defense was pretty bad, but he shrugs it off, after all, his team is leading the league. Eventually, security manages to pry her off the barrier and guides her to a corner. She apologizes, blaming her outburst on her frustration. The security guy gets it, but he also tells her that wasn't cool and she shouldn't do it again. Feeling a bit down, she goes back to her seat, rubbing her head. She's disappointed in the futures, calling them a bunch of losers. And she blames her drinking on them if they weren't so bad, she wouldn't have to drink so much. Next scene, we're back at a bar and guess who's chilling there? Our super fan from the stadium, Sunga Shin. She's sitting there, lost in thought, mulling over the game she was rooting for earlier. She's so ticked off that she's decided to ditch supporting the team because, in her eyes, they're just a bunch of losers. And just as she's brooding, this hot guy comes up to her at the bar. His opening line isn't anything to write home about, but when she takes a good look at him, she has a change of heart. So, she's like, why not, and agrees to have a drink with him. She even invites him to sit with her. They enjoy some drinks and chat for a while. Things seem to be going pretty well because next thing you know, they're heading off to a private room together. Once they're alone, she gets a good look at him without his clothes on. He's looking fine, and she upgrades him from a 3.9 to a solid 4 out of 5. Things heat up, and they start making out. 
She notices his hands are kind of rough, maybe he's into sports? That gets her wondering if he's an athlete, which only makes him more attractive to her. He seems to be digging her too. In the middle of their makeout session, she asks him which baseball team he's on. His answer shocks her, he's a wannabe ant. That's a deal breaker, so she politely asks him to leave. After he's gone, she reveals a bombshell. Turns out, she's Sunga Shin, the daughter of Chairman Kim, who owns the company that sponsors the wannabe ants. She's also his illegitimate child. She's frustrated with herself for always falling for baseball players and wonders why they can't just focus on the game instead of chasing after girls. Switching scenes, we see this guy, John, reminiscing about the ants' victory. Suddenly, a girl storms in and throws a box at him. It's Jean, John's sister. He asks her why she's late and complains that the box hurt. Then he sees her crying and wonders if she had a fight with her boyfriend, Saiwook. But Jean just cries more before finally revealing that Saiwook dumped her. She's upset because he hasn't finished his military service and blames John for setting them up. Even though John can't believe Saiwook would do that, he apologizes and promises not to talk to Saiwook anymore. So, John decides to cheer up his sis by offering to get some fried chicken. But she's not really feeling it, and he asks her what she'd prefer instead. Through her tears, she clenches her fists and starts asking about the baseball game his team played that day. He fills her in, telling her they were up against the Futures Victory team at their home base, Mahan Stadium. He adds that his team, the wannabe ants, were leading right up until the ninth inning but kept scoring points like they were Christmas gifts. He then mentions a hilarious goof-up by the Futures team during the game and offers to show her the clip. In response, Jean throws him a curveball. She tells him that if he really wants to make her feel better, he should root for the Futures team this year, even though they're not the best. John is taken aback. Switch teams? He asks if there's anything else he can do to help her feel better, saying he'll do whatever it takes. But she just gives him this hard look and asks if he cares more about baseball than his own sister. John quickly reassures her that she's his number one priority and promises to support the Futures team if it'll make her happy. He apologizes again for setting her up with Saiwook and admits if he knew Saiwook would turn out to be such a jerk, he wouldn't have introduced them or even been friends with him. Feeling somewhat appeased, Jean heads out to chill with her friends, leaving John to clean up the mess she made. As he's tidying up, he assures himself that he doesn't mind cheering for the underdogs. After all, his team, the wannabe ants, are the champs. As he's cleaning, his mind wanders back to the girl he saw climbing the fence at the stadium. He can't help but hope he'll run into her again next time he's there. The next day, there's another baseball match on the cards, and guess who shows up? Our girl Sunga. But she's not feeling it this time. She's thinking maybe she won't support her team anymore, she's kinda had it with the whole baseball scene. She even tells herself this could be her last visit to the stadium as she takes in the sights and sounds. Amidst all the hustle and bustle, Sunga hears some super excited fans yapping about how they hope the wannabes will win the upcoming game. They're all hyped up about the team possibly winning the series without losing a single game, they call that a sweep. They're also pretty stoked about the Futures team, thanking them for making the game so thrilling. Sunga listens in, a little bummed out. She figures, yeah, maybe the wannabes should get that sweep and boost their stats so they can really enjoy their victory. As for her own team, she's pretty much lost all hope. She walks into a seating area and spots a family, a couple and their kid. She rolls her eyes, thinking they should be setting a better example for their kid. I mean, why would anyone bring a kid to a game where the futures are playing, knowing they're likely to lose? But the kid seems hopeful, convinced the team will win that day. Sunga watches them and thinks about her own name. Her dad named her right before she was born, just when the Futures had won a game. Fans thought she brought luck to the team. Now, at 27, she's ticked off because the team hasn't won a single game since she was born. To deal with her frustration, she takes a swig from her drink and sarcastically bets the team will screw up like they always do. She's pretty much decided that she's done with this team after today. After a bit, the scoreboard shows the scores the wannabe ants are leading 7-0. The top of the second inning seems to drag on forever. She spots some fans munching on bibimbap, a traditional Korean dish, which surprises her. She walks up to them, asking if it's even allowed to eat that stuff here. 
They tell her they started eating because they couldn't yell at the players directly. The team's lousy performance had led to a huge point gap, and the fans were pretty bummed out. Sunga wonders if she's the only one who's upset about the team's performance. In her frustration, she feels like lashing out at the team. She thinks there's no point in sticking around for a game where her team is doing so badly and considers heading home. Just then, she sees a player from the Futures team, Kihyun Kim, step onto the field in the second inning. A guy next to her starts cheering super loud for another player, Yung Min Yoon. His cheering is so energetic, she thinks he's putting the official cheerleaders to shame. Back on the field, the Futures team manages to get three outs in a row without any batter reaching first base, signaling the end of the inning. Sung is really ticked off about her team's losing streak. She tosses out a sarcastic suggestion to the fans around her, maybe we should all just go learn a new language instead of wasting our time here. John, who's been listening in, responds with a sympathetic poor futures. He takes a swig of his drink and they share a look. That's when he realizes she's the same girl he saw at the last game and had been hoping to run into again. He's pretty excited and asks her how she's doing. She gives him this sad smile and says, about as well as the last 27 years. Despite her gloomy outlook, she can't help but admire his enthusiasm for the team even though it seems like he's being punished for it. This gets him choked up, literally. He ends up coughing on his drink, but quickly apologizes for the mess. Intrigued, she asks him why he's so gung-ho about a team that's probably going to lose. He bows his head and explains that's just the nature of baseball, it ain't over till it's over. They both nod, repeating, till it's over. This little exchange makes Sunga realize she's found a kindred spirit, someone else who's just as passionate about baseball. Then, out of nowhere, the kiss Kim lands on them. The crowd goes nuts, cheering them on to kiss. John's taken aback, saying he's never been on screen before, but he waves it off with a laugh. Sunga, however, decides to just go for it and leans in for a smooch. The crowd goes wild, and John's left blushing like a tomato. The game's about to start up again in the third inning. Sung is crossing her fingers for the futures to get three outs quick, while John's hoping for a swift three-pitch strikeout. As luck would have it, the Ants player, Seong Jin Koo, strikes out after just three pitches, leading to three rapid outs for the futures. Thanks to that strong start, the futures finally score a run. The crowd of futures fans goes wild, celebrating this unexpected turn of events. This just goes to show, the game ain't over till it's over. The fans are buzzing with hope and excitement, all chanting together, it ain't over till it's over. In the next scene, Sunga is brimming with excitement as she heads home, still riding the high of the match. To extend her celebration, she heads to the local bar. When she arrives at the bar, her excitement is so palpable that she offers to cover the cost of drinks for everyone present. This generous gesture takes the other patrons by surprise, causing them to inquire whether the Futures actually won the match. An overly excited Sunga confirms the victory and goes on to explain that the team secured the win at the last minute, leading her to feel an extra surge of happiness. The people at the bar are slightly taken aback by Sunga's unusual behavior. They're accustomed to the Futures facing defeats more often than not, so the bartender expresses his disbelief at the team's unexpected triumph. In a playful manner, someone even jokes that Sunga might be attempting to give them digestive troubles with her drink offer. She responds by stating that she's simply in an exceptionally good mood and playfully warns him not to spoil her happiness. She then humorously refers to herself as the team's lucky charm. Sunga then proudly declares that the futures are late bloomers. She firmly believes that the team's winning streak will continue, and boldly expresses her conviction that they will emerge victorious in all consequent games. The bartender advises her to enjoy her drink before it loses its fizz, and in her cheerfulness, she names it the victor's drink and finishes it excitedly. Sunga then wonders if this is what victory tastes like and likens it to something sweet and fast-paced. She expresses her desire for every day to be as joyful as this moment and wishes for the team's success to continue until she becomes tired of it. Seems like she must be pretty excited, as she decides to rewatch the match on her phone because she can't seem to get enough of it. She recounts the important moments of the match, highlighting the timely hit, lucky strike, and grand slam that contributed to the team's victory. Her happiness is so overwhelming that she jokingly remarks she could die of happiness. 
She also joyfully expresses her determination to witness her beloved team's participation in the Korean series, the ultimate championship in professional Korean baseball. Just then, a young dude approaches Sungha and inquires if she's by herself then asks if she'd like to join him for a drink. But she perceives him as impolite and proceeds to directly ask about his age, causing the guy to state that he's 25. Without skipping a beat, Sungha reveals that she's 27 and expresses her lack of interest in spending time with someone who's unpleasant. Apparently, our main character isn't into younger guys. However, Mr. 25-year-old gets offended by her response and questions her identity, before leaving the scene in frustration. Meanwhile, Sungha, whose thoughts are preoccupied with ensuring her club's victory, contemplates following the same routine as today to secure another win. This includes maintaining the same attire, hairstyle, and food choice, and even recreating the kiss she shared with the guy from the game, a ritual she believes contributed to her team's success. Later in the day, we find John reminiscing about their kiss, feeling both embarrassed and flustered by the memories. He recalls how Sunga had a collection of teen jerseys with her, possibly indicating her involvement as a club member or something else. Lost in thoughts about Sunga, John's friend calls out to him, questioning his lateness from the game and his choice of wearing a Futures jersey. As it turns out, John's friend Waiho is the very same guy who had made out with Sunga at the bar on the day her team lost. Hmm, it seems things are getting interesting, don't you think? Back to reality, John reacts with a slight movement and explains that there's a lengthy story behind it. He then inquires if Waiho has finished training. Taking the conversation further, Waiho inquires about the well-being of Jean, and John responds defensively, asking why his friend is interested in his sister's welfare. Upon this question from John, Waiho reflects that he only sees Jean as John's younger sister and nothing more, implying that their relationship lacks a deeper connection. But then, his though drift back to the incident last Sunday. He recalls that last Sunday, he was still caught up in his own thoughts about being asked to leave after the hot makeout session he had with the girl he met at the bar. For him, that incident held a lot of significance as he felt a strong sense of shame because of what transpired that day. The experience was so uncomfortable that he believed it would remain etched in his memory forever. However, at that moment his self-loathing was interrupted by the sounds of someone sobbing and sniffling nearby. At first, he was shocked, thinking he was the one sobbing, but as he looked around, he realized that it was actually Jean who was in tears. Curious about the reason behind Jin's distress, he tried to ask her what was going on, but her crying was so intense that she could barely respond. Despite her emotional state, she managed to let out a scream expressing her confusion about her destination or where she was headed. Waiho's concern for Jean deepened, and he persisted in trying to find out the cause of her tears. Meanwhile, some onlookers noticed Jin's emotional state and speculated that he might be responsible for making her cry. However, he remained determined to find out Jean was in pain, but she continued crying, refusing to stop. Then, in an effort to provide some comfort, he suggested that they go to a more private space. Once they found a quieter place, Jean finally opened up to him about what went down with her boyfriend, Saiwook. She recounted a hurtful incident involving his actions, which left her deeply upset. Waiho reacted strongly to the story and even used some harsh language to express his anger towards Saiwook. He questioned why she allowed her boyfriend's behavior to go unchecked and expressed his frustration. This anger on Waiho's part intensified, and he even proposed to confront Saiwook, with the help of John. Waiho had then offered Jean his jacket due to the cold weather, however, she declined his offer, insisting that she was not feeling cold. Then, curious about his well-dressed appearance, she inquired about where he had been previously, which caused him to remember the incident involving Sunga and him again. He eventually responded to Jean, admitting that he had done something foolish and out of character. He explained to her that he had a one-night stand with a woman who was the illegitimate daughter of a baseball team owner. He also shared that while he was uncertain if such situations happen in the major league, they apparently do occur in the minor league. He even added that the owner of their baseball team had a secret child who held some heavyweight influence. Jin's reaction to his confession was a look of utter disgust as she asserted that he would likely be chosen in the draft but also pointed out that he was acting inappropriately. Waiho acknowledged his own shortcomings and ignorance in the matter and explained that he met an attractive woman at a bar, not realizing initially that she was the owner's daughter. He also made a heartfelt promise, and even went as far as swearing on his future in baseball, that he would never exploit someone for personal gain. Waiho furthermore tried to convince Jean of his sincerity by recounting how Sunga had kicked him out following the incident. 
He then expressed some deep regret over his actions, but Jean found his remorseful statement rather amusing and burst out laughing. Jean then told him she had an idea, she proposed that they go somewhere together for a bit, hinting that he knew where they were heading. Apparently, it was a baseball court she'd been referring to and when they got there, Waiho found it amusing the way she held the bat, jokingly remarking that her eyes must have been really messed up from all that crying she had done earlier. But Jim was really eager to play baseball so he had offered to help her learn and guided her to handle the ball better and direct the bat accurately. He then encouraged her to give it a shot herself and she eagerly agreed. Her first attempt was pretty awful, and he joked that it would be a miracle if she managed to even touch the ball. However, she surprised him by making an unexpected deal. If she managed to hit the ball, he would spend the night with her because she felt lonely. This statement caught Waiho off guard, but he agreed to her challenge. With some serious determination, she swung the bat and struck the ball, and it was a success. Waiho was genuinely impressed, but then, this also meant that he had to keep his promise and spend the night with her. In the next scene, as you may have already guessed, things got more intense between the pair and they got intimate. The following morning, Waiho couldn't help but reflect on the events of the previous night. He pondered over the fact that he and Jean engaged in intimate activities all through the night. He also questioned his own sanity for getting involved with his friend's sister in such a manner. Contemplating the situation, he suggested to her that perhaps they should act as if the night never occurred. However, she expressed her discomfort with this notion, pointing out that they were both adults and had the freedom to engage in such interactions. But even she couldn't shake off the awkwardness of the situation, seeing that Waiho was a friend of her brother. She then decided to leave before her parents became concerned about her whereabouts. And as they parted ways, Waiho paused and gazed back at Jean thinking to himself that they had to pretend like it never happened. Snapping back to the present, Waiho realizes that he still hasn't answered Johns' question as to why he was inquiring about Jean so he quickly brushes it off saying it's nothing. He then tries to divert the topic and ease the awkwardness he's feeling by suggesting to John that they should have dinner together in the near future. Then he murmurs that he has training to attend and dashes off leaving John quite perplexed about his friend's weird behavior. In the next scene, John approaches Jin's room and knocks on her door, informing her that he had run into Waiho earlier and that Waiho had inquired about her well-being. Jean lies on her bed pretending to be asleep but her heart is heavy upon hearing that Waiho had asked of her. The scene then shifts to the following day at the baseball stadium where Sunga is already settled into her seat, ready for the game. However, her focus soon drifts away from the game at hand and her thoughts become consumed by the recent victory of the Futures in their previous match. She expresses her deep desire to relive that triumphant feeling once more. And for her to do that, she needs John. Meanwhile, John makes his appearance, while saying to himself that he came all the way for this and he hopes to cross paths with Sunga again. Just then as if he conjured her up from his mind he spots her and Sunga warmly invites him to sit beside her. With his presence, all three of Sunga's cherished lucky charms are gathered, leading her to believe that destiny is at play. The baseball game is already underway, but the futures are struggling and falling behind, causing John to remark on the team's poor performance and then jokingly question if the players are being paid to perform so poorly. Then he quickly checks himself and apologizes to Sunga, stating that he shouldn't be talking about his team like that. Sunga then redirects his attention, asking why he would travel all the way to a different team stadium just to watch a team that's currently losing. Caught off guard, John reveals that it's punishment but when Sunga questions him he quickly realizes himself and laughs it off while his heart pounded loudly in his chest. However, Sunga is suspicious as her intuition tells her something isn't quite right. John then redirects the conversation by telling Sunga about the history of the futures, mentioning that they have a long history and that they put in a lot of effort. He also talks about their recent win, saying that the victory was connected to the time when they both cheered for the club together. John then mentions that he believes in things like fate and destiny. He thinks that if they cheer together once more today, it might improve the future's odds of winning. While it might seem a bit random, John holds a positive outlook on their support making a difference. In a sudden change of topic, Sunga asks John if he's a fan of the ants and if his friend is a player in the minor league team. John is surprised by this question and wonders how Sunga knows about his friend and his connection to the ants. Sunga then explains that she has seen John before, cheering for the ants, and his face stuck in her memory. She thinks that John might have been cheering for the ants because his friend was part of the lineup on that particular day. 
Caught off guard and feeling uneasy, John's behavior changes, he becomes visibly nervous, and beads of sweat start forming on his forehead. Despite his discomfort, he eventually admits that his friend was indeed playing on that day and that this was the reason he had been cheering for the ants. Phew, that was definitely a close one. Sangha tells him that he's truly a big fan of the futures. Moreover, she believes in the idea that destiny shapes human lives. She then reveals her strategy, which involves repeating their past actions because she believes that those actions led to their previous success. She points out that since they're the away team, the KC Crescent fans will be shown on the kiss cam. Despite this, she thinks they should give it a shot. Additionally, she mentions they're at a baseball stadium, and their goal now is to make others playfully tell them to find a private space, something she finds amusing and worth trying. She's convinced that if they share another kiss, their team will win the game. Meanwhile, John's phone rings in his pocket, it's his sister Jean calling. Sunga continues, offering to cover the expenses for his tickets, food, accommodations, and anything else he might need and she even suggests that they watch all the games together that year. While still processing everything she just said, he suddenly hears his name being called out, it's Saiwook. Saiwook comes over and playfully teases John about being with a girl and inquires about his sister Jean as well. Despite feeling a surge of anger, especially after learning that Saiwook is already involved with another girl, John manages to stay composed by tightly clenching his fist. Earlier, it was revealed that Saiwook had served in the military. This memory resurfaces, and the scene takes us back to the time when Jean saw him off as he embarked on his military service. In this scene, Saiwook regrets not having a more intimate relationship with Jean before leaving for the service. So he devises a plan to make it happen during his time on leave. The next scene then shows the end of Saiwook's leave and it looks like he had just finished having dinner with Jean. He feels a bit frustrated because Jean ate a lot, and he worries that he is going to spend a lot of his money. Jean quickly apologizes for her behavior and offers to pay him back for half of the money he spent on the meal, but he declines her offer. He then opens up about his feelings for her, he admits that he normally does not spend much money on dates, usually around 30 bucks, but he is willing to spend more for Jean because he cares about her. He also mentions that she has been giving him a lot of snacks, enough to share with his friends. Then he suggests going inside somewhere, possibly to sober up a bit because she had been drinking, he tries to pull her inside, but she insists on going home. This situation upsets him because he was hoping for some intimacy, and he is frustrated that she's not cooperating. He pulls her hand and raises his voice, telling her to go inside. People passing by start whispering, thinking it might be a couple's argument and some even consider intervening. In response to the attention and whispers, Saiwook lets go of her hand and accuses her of not trusting him. He claims he was just worried about her and this makes her apologize and explain that she found the place scary. Saiwook continues to twist the story and insists that the relationship is over and then walks away, leaving her behind. He starts regretting spending money on their dinner and feels frustrated about the situation. He also thinks about her physical appearance, particularly her body, which he wanted to touch and he reflects that if he knew things would end like this, he would have tried to be more physical with her. With all these thoughts circulating in his mind, Saiwook starts salivating a bit, however, he quickly snaps back to the present, rejoining the ongoing conversation with John. He wipes his mouth, then turns to John and asks him to convey his greetings to Jean. While Sung is watching John and Saiwook chat, she starts to suspect that Jean and Saiwook might have been an item once upon a time. She gets this vibe from the way John flat out refuses to pass on Saiwook's message to his sis and tells him to back off. John's pretty upset, questioning if their friendship even meant anything to Saiwook. He warns Saiwook to stay away from him and his sister, making it clear that they're done being buddies. Saiwook just brushes him off with some pretty harsh words about Jean, which really gets under Sunda's skin. She suggests to John that maybe he should give Saiwook a piece of his mind, face to face. John admits that while he'd love to give Saiwook a piece of his mind, he knows better than to lose his cool over someone like him. He reckons Saiwook's just showing his true colors as a coward. Sunga grins at this, saying she's all for standing up for what's right and she can't stand seeing people getting hurt. They get back to the game, and after a while, John decides he needs to head home and mull over everything that's happened. Just as he's about to leave, the stadium's kiss cam comes on, causing quite a stir. Right then, Sunga starts wondering if she's been doing all this because she's a die-hard baseball fan or if she feels bad for John, who's been having a rough time. 
She snaps out of her thoughts, grabs John, and plants one on him, much to the crowd's delight. The kiss gets everyone's attention, including Saiwook, who's not too thrilled about it. Even the camera guy spots a couple of Futures fans in the crowd and thinks about putting them on the big screen. John's a bit taken aback at first, not sure if he should return the kiss or not. But then he decides to go with the flow and pulls Sunga closer, making the kiss even more intense. This cracks her up, and she teases him about getting a bit too into it. When the game finally wraps up, Sunga's over the moon. She's convinced that sticking to her usual routine was the right move and plans to keep it up. John asks her where she's headed next and mentions he's thinking of hitting the sauna. She offers to give him a lift since she drove to the game and quickly gives her driver a ring. Inside, she's buzzing with excitement and can't wait for the next victory. She pulls out her phone to relive the win, while John sneaks a peek at her screen to check the ant's score. He's stoked to see they won, but Sunga thinks he's just happy about the future's win. As they arrive at their intended location, John indicates his readiness to depart, prompting Sunga to question why he made the journey if he didn't plan to stay. He becomes shy and admits that he simply wanted to spend a bit more time with her. Despite his reservations, she encourages him to accompany her, but he politely declines. Sunga starts explaining that the club's triumph can be attributed to their unity, symbolized by a shared kiss, and reminds John of their agreement where she covers expenses if he attends all the games. Despite her persuasion, he remains adamant about going to a more affordable sauna due to the high costs of the place she brought him to. His refusal frustrates Sunga, leading her to grasp his arm and emphasize the need to rest well that night before the next game. She points out that it is her money and sleeping in a sauna is not a possible option, so they must faithfully follow their established routine to secure victory. Eventually, he relents and agrees to stay with her. Sunga and John walk over to the reception desk, where the person in charge of the hotel is, trying to get rooms to stay in. However, the receptionist tells them that the hotel only has one type of room available, which has two separate beds in it. Sunga is okay with this and agrees to take the room but John is not happy with the idea of sharing a room with her, especially when he finds out it is the only available option. He even suggests that he might go find another hotel to stay in because he is uncomfortable with the idea of sharing a room. He is concerned about how they can both sleep in the same room and whether she can trust him. She explains that her decision to share a room with him has nothing to do with trust and she believes it's the best choice given the circumstances. The room they are given is surprisingly large and nice looking. John is impressed with how the room looks and he starts looking at himself in the mirror, he thanks Sunga for choosing this room and promises to stay unnoticed. However, there is an awkward moment when he accidentally sees her starting to undress. He quickly apologizes for looking and asks if he should leave the room so she can change in private but she is surprised by his actions. She tells him that he came with her to a hotel, and she assumed he understood what might happen in this situation. John, feeling nervous, asks her what she means by that, not sure what to expect. She then brings him closer and encourages him to think about the situation. This thought startles John, and he begins to apologize for his behavior. She leans in and assures him that there's no need to apologize anymore and she hints that things are going to be different between them from now on. He asks her if she was talking about having a close, non-romantic relationship where they simply watch baseball together. She responds by saying that this idea only applies to regular, ordinary guys. She then asks him if he has ever taken a good look at himself in the mirror, and she mentions that with his strong arms, chest, face, and overall physique, he should have known what could happen if he agreed to stay in a hotel room with her. She goes on to say that when he mentioned he was going to sleep there, she thought he meant they would be intimate. This surprises John, and he quickly corrects her, explaining that is not what he meant at all. She playfully encourages him to take off his clothes. This makes him nervous, and he shields his face as she tries to lift his shirt. His nervousness reaches a point where he asks her if he can just go to a sauna instead but she responds by telling him to stop being so anxious because she does not intend to do anything to him. However, she has a question for him, and she wonders why he is crying. She also reminds him that she did not ask him to be in a relationship or to marry her, it's purely about a physical connection. In response, he admits that he doesn't know why he is crying, but he honestly has some interest in the idea. John then reveals that he is actually a virgin, but he is willing to try his best if she is okay with it. 
he suggests that she could also teach him a thing or two, he adds that he is skilled in physical activities, which leads her to express her frustration that no one has experienced his physical qualities before. In addition, he inquires of her how he might improve her mood, prompting a smile to grace her lips as she candidly expresses her preference for a more intense and passionate interaction. With a playful command, she urges him to extend his tongue outward, this gesture becomes the reason for an exchange of kisses. Amidst their shared intimacy, she raises a query about his decision to retain his virginity, a question to which he finds himself without a ready answer. However, he offers a sincere commitment to compensate for this inexperience through future actions. Sunga, deeply intrigued by his genuine behavior, commends his lack of arrogance, noting that women typically hold contempt for individuals who exude such behavior, as it may come across as insincere and lacking authenticity. Sangha has this belief that he's like a special prize for her because she's been acting in a really disciplined or saintly way. But even though she has this belief, what she really wants deep down is for their team to win the Korean Series Championship instead. During their interaction, she advises John to stop being overly polite and to understand the situation they're in. He's in a bit of a dilemma because he's not sure what to call her. She doesn't like being addressed as Nuna, which is a respectful term for an older sister, because she's actually an only child and dislikes that word. So, he decides to ask her what she'd prefer him to call her. Surprisingly, she playfully suggests the term master. At first, John is unsure and struggles with his words, but eventually, he manages to say master. This makes her smile brightly, and in response, she gives him a sweet kiss. Sunga then asks him if he is ready to go to bed, however, John decides not to sleep next to her and instead sneaks out of bed. He mentions that he plans to sleep on the couch or the floor, even though there are two beds available. He explains that he can't bring himself to sleep next to his master. Despite his reluctance, she urges him to hurry and join her on the bed. As he climbs onto the bed, he hugs her closely. During this interaction, she comments jokingly on John's chest size, suggesting he needs a bra due to its apparent largeness. The conversation takes a turn when Sunga realizes that she missed watching a baseball game and an interview featuring someone named Su Hun. John takes this opportunity to engage her in a conversation, he playfully calls her master and points out her strong passion for baseball. He expresses surprise that she goes to baseball games alone and he also asks about how long she has been a fan of the Futures, a baseball team. Sunga, however, misunderstands his intentions, thinking he is trying to test her knowledge, because she is a girl. She mentions encountering guys like that before and recalls a specific incident when a guy at the stadium tried to teach her about baseball. Sangha expresses her frustration about how men frequently quiz women about baseball rules and regulations. She emphasizes that her interest in baseball is not to gain approval from men, and she believes everyone has their own reasons for initially getting into the sport. John, feeling sorry, acknowledges that he did not intend to come across that way. He's asked why he attends baseball games alone, and he explains that he lacks companions because his sister finds the games dull and his friend is preoccupied with training. He adds that he always wished to experience a game with close friends or family, sharing the excitement of cheering together, but he never had that opportunity. He apologizes for being overexcited at finding someone who shares his passion for baseball. He also confesses that he is eager to hear Sunga's story and that the time they are spending together is quite special since it's his first such experience. Consequently, he does not want the night to end immediately. Sunga opens up about her desire to find a companion to attend games with and she also reveals that she attends games alone because she doesn't have anyone to accompany her anymore. John reassures her that she now has someone to accompany her, and their connection deepens as they share a kiss. Meanwhile, John's phone begins to ring, situated in his trouser pocket on the floor. In the following part of the story, we find out that Jean is attempting to reach out to her brother, who has not returned home yet. She's puzzled as to why he is not answering her calls because she has important things to discuss with him. On a different note, there's Saiwook who is preoccupied with thoughts of Jean. He is considering the idea of calling her, but he is worried about seeming too eager or desperate. Saiwook wonders if he is the only one experiencing these emotions, but he decides to dismiss these feelings for now by watching some videos on YouTube. Meanwhile, John and Sangha are in a hotel room, enjoying a peaceful moment. John has already fallen asleep, but Sangha is still awake, reflecting on a conversation they had earlier. Several hours pass, and John wakes up to take a shower. 
As he quietly leaves the room, Sunga remains asleep in bed, making snorting and snoring sounds. After finishing his shower, he returns to the room, being careful not to wake her up. John can't help but stare at her as she snoozes next to him. She's just so darn cute when she sleeps. Waking up with her, it feels like they're in a real deal romance. After last night, he feels this deep connection with her. That kiss man, he can't get it out of his head. He wants another one, and soon. But whoa, his daydreaming gets cut short when she tosses and turns. She wakes up, rubbing her eyes and admits that she forgot to say sorry for something. Apparently, she gets a bit ticked off when guys talk about girls who dig baseball. It's a pet peeve. But hey, no harm done, right? John assures her it's all good. Even though the timing might be a bit off, John decides to spill his feelings. He's glad she opened up to him. He got to know her a bit better. Suddenly, she playfully tugs at his cheek. It's a cute gesture, and he can't help but tilt his head to the side, chuckling. She can't resist his charm, it seems. Feeling the good vibes, John gathers up the courage to ask if he can kiss her. But surprise! She flips him over and goes in for a passionate smooch fest. It's a mix of embarrassment and pure joy for him. Deciding to give her some breathing space, he thinks about getting something to eat before she fully wakes up. While he's lost in thought, he remembers her teasing him about needing a bra. He's still mulling over his physique when Sunga pops up from nowhere, grabbing his chest and declaring she's hungry. She leaves the decision of what to eat up to him, then heads off for a shower. John, wanting to keep her happy, offers to foot the bill for their meal. He watches her saunter off to the shower, his mind still playing catch up with all the playful moments they've shared. After Sunga's done showering, they both get dressed and ready to head out. They're brainstorming what to eat, pasta, tiakbaki, sushi, salad. But she doesn't seem too thrilled with these choices. She's more into the idea of having some rice soup. So they head over to this cozy little restaurant and order up some steaming bowls of rice soup. As they dive into their meal, Sunga notices John's not adding any of the radish seasoning, which is kind of the norm. He admits he's not really a rice soup guy, but she's quick to tell him this place is different, the soup doesn't have that weird meaty smell most places do. He's pretty impressed by how thoughtful she is. While she's busy munching away and sneaking peeks at her phone, she suddenly chokes on her food. John's instantly worried and asks her what's wrong. She hands her phone over to him and there it is a video of their kiss cam moment from the game. They start freaking out, wondering what to do next. They think about leaving a comment asking the uploader to take the video down, but they're not sure if it'll work. Frustrated, Sunga starts venting, even suggesting they should just call out the uploader. Then she brings up the team's baffling decision to trade their star batter. She's so worked up that she accidentally knocks over John's drink. She's convinced the manager's lost his marbles, trading Yo Wul Kong for some other player. She can't wrap her head around why they'd trade him when he's set to have a great season. She's so confused she's even thinking of staging a protest with John. He avoids the topic by bending down to pick up his phone, which he dropped earlier. He's trying to figure out how to explain things to her without upsetting her too much. Just as he's about to sit back down, she shoves her phone in his face. The screen's playing their kiss cam moment. She admits it's the first time she's been on camera during an ad break at another team's stadium. He asks if he should ask for the video to be taken down, but she's actually kind of happy about it. If anything, she'd rather get rid of the biased umpire and commentators from that Sil Rocks and Hawks game. She keeps ranting about the game, and John can't help but find her a bit rough around the edges. But her passion for baseball is pretty clear. She notices he's not eating and asks why, but he's too lost in his thoughts to answer. He's starting to really like her. As she continues talking about baseball, she wonders why Junchiol Cho has so many fans. She asks John if he agrees with her, and he nods in agreement. Meanwhile, Jin's making her way to Gunji Stadium. She's hoping to meet Waiho and find out where her brother is since he didn't come home the previous night. It's a hot day and the sun's beating down on her. She's feeling tired and decides to take a break to rest up. After a bit, Waiho finally shows up at the stadium. He's all, sorry I'm late, guys, and asks about John. Jean hands him a cold water bottle, 
and he puts it against his face to cool off. The sight of the water trickling down his chest catches Jin's eye for a sec, but she quickly snaps out of it. She's got one thing on her mind, figuring out where John is. She tells Waiho that John hasn't come home yet and isn't picking up his phone. She wonders if he's still following through with that punishment he got. Then we switch over to the stadium, where everyone's buzzing, super excited about the game that's about to start. As Jean makes her way to her seat, she accidentally steps on someone who's lying on the floor. Turns out it's Sunga. Jean immediately feels bad and helps her up, even offers her some of her water. But Sunga's the one who ends up saying sorry, feeling bad about scaring Jean by lying on the floor like that. Just then, John rushes in, completely oblivious to Jean being there. He cracks a joke about how Sunga should at least put something on the floor before laying down. Jin's totally thrown for a loop when she hears her brother calling some woman master. It's super weird to her, and she can't figure out why he'd do that. John quickly asks Jean what she's doing there since she's always been pretty vocal about hating baseball. She shoots back that she's just making sure he's keeping his promises. Before she can spill the beans to Sunga about what those promises are, John clamps a hand over her mouth. He doesn't want her giving away any secrets. As they all settle in to watch the game, Jean can't help asking if he calls Sunga master as part of some punishment. He nods yes, and she almost blurts out what the actual punishment is. But again, he stops her from saying too much. He's still kind of in shock that she's at a baseball game, but he's also pretty stoked about it. He keeps telling Sunga that Jean isn't into baseball like at all. He says she thinks it's boring and usually nods off whenever he watches a game. This gets him and Sunga talking about baseball, and Jean can't help noticing that her brother seems way more excited than she's ever seen him. John realizes that Jean forgot her ticket and he's about to run after her to give it back, but Sunga suggests he can just hand it over when he sees her at home later. He's quick to point out that he might not go home right away because he kinda wants to hang out with Sunga some more. Then he goes all red in the face and runs off. Sunga can't help but find his behavior pretty adorable and wonders if that's his way of flirting. Meanwhile, Saiwook runs into Jean as she's heading out of the stadium. He teases her about her team losing and asks if she's rooting for the futures, considering she doesn't really follow baseball. Seeing that his girlfriend is on the phone, he stops Jean and asks her if she's by herself and if she's got a boyfriend. He even suggests they could grab a drink after the game. Since Jean doesn't react to his moves, he figures she must be single, and then he tells her to speak up, thinking she might have something to say to him. At the same time, Jin's been coming to terms with the fact that their fight marked the end of their relationship. She can't help but wonder if things would have turned out differently if she'd agreed to go to the motel with him. Saiwook asks her again why she's at the stadium, especially since she doesn't know the first thing about baseball. He even asks if she's there just to see him. As soon as she says she didn't come to see him and reminds him they're broken up, he takes his hands off her. Then she walks away. He grabs her hand and asks why she's giving him attitude and if she's been learning how to attract guys. When she pushes him away, his drink spills and people start buzzing, wondering if there's a fight brewing. In a sly move, he tells everyone that Jean is his girlfriend and she's just upset because her team is losing. He tries to get her to leave with him, but she stands her ground, telling him she doesn't want to go anywhere with him and making it clear that they're over. Just as Saiwook's trying to persuade her to come with him, John steps in and tells him to let his sister go. Sunga can't help but wonder how her team ever made it pro with the way they're playing. She notes that the kiss cam is about to start, but John hasn't come back yet. Remembering their earlier encounter, Saiwook asks John why he wasn't with Jean when he saw her. He also mentions being uncomfortable with John touching his shoulder and tries to convince him that women often say one thing and mean another. This sets John off and he snaps at Saiwook, telling him that when Jean says no, she means no and that should be respected. But Saiwook just fires back with a bunch of insults. Sunga steps in, throwing some choice words at Saiwook. She totally disagrees with his take on how women communicate, calling it total BS. She argues that everyone speaks the same language and it's up to the listener to understand. She even suggests that the real problem is men not listening and tells Saiwook he should clean out his ears. In a fit of frustration, she even punches his chest. Then she grabs Jean, ready to leave. 
When Jean apologizes for possibly ruining Sunga's enjoyment of the game, Sunga reassures her that it's actually the Futures who should be saying sorry for their lousy performance. As they're walking away, Saiwook reaches out and grabs Sunga, asking her who she is. He's also a little miffed that she didn't let him get a word in edgeways and now she's taking his ex-girlfriend away. She shoots back, don't tell me you've forgotten my face already? And who was that girl you were with yesterday? Just then, John steps in and shoves Saiwook's hands off Sunga. He tells Saiwook he won't be seeing them again and suggests they get going. Sunga chimes in and says, how about we grab dinner? My team's losing anyways and we miss the kiss cam. Saiwook suddenly tries to pull Jin's hair, but John's having none of it. He grabs Saiwook's shirt and can't believe he's being so aggressive. He regrets ever introducing him to his sister. He's so mad he's about to punch Saiwook, but Sunga steps in and stops him. She tells John she's had enough of looking at Saiwook and suggests they just leave. Sunga then takes out some money and offers to cover the cost of cleaning Saiwook's clothes, which got stained from a spilled drink earlier. But Jean quickly steps in and advises against giving him any money. She explains that Saiwook still owes her $200 from their shared date account. Sunga's taken aback, she didn't know they had a date account and can't believe Saiwook expects to date without spending any money. John's still pretty ticked off at Saiwook for being so aggressive towards Jean. But Sunga, the so-called master, reminds him they should handle this differently. She suggests they let Saiwook go without causing a scene. To show her support for Jean, Sunga slips some money into Saiwook's shirt and tells him he's pretty lucky she had enough cash for hot dogs. Then they decide it's time to leave. As they're walking away, Saiwook complains that the money Sunga gave him isn't enough to cover the cost of his stained clothes. She counters by saying his clothes are probably fake anyway. But if he insists, she'll give him more money. She then goes around the stadium, asking people if they have any leftover food. Once she's collected some scraps, she dumps them all over Saiwook's clothes. He's totally taken aback and starts questioning her sanity. But before he can finish, she hands him more money for his food and dry cleaning expenses. Sunga pulls John aside and tells him she's got this and that she can handle Saiwook with her wallet. She goes on to say that she's all about fairness and can't stand when people are treated unfairly. John looks surprised at her words and his sister notices a different look on his face, something she's never seen before. Out of the blue, Saiwook gives Sunga a call, which catches her completely off guard. She wonders why he's ringing her up again, considering she already handed him a chunk of change and even said sorry. She could have just apologized, but instead, she gave him a grand as a peace offering. Saiwook, though, isn't satisfied and insists it's not enough. He tries to guilt her by talking about the emotional distress he's been through because of her actions. But Sunga doesn't back down, pointing out that he accepted her money, which means he agreed to her terms. When Saiwook pretends to have no memory of being caught on camera taking the cash, she gently reminds him of the evidence she has. She also warns him that he might end up in legal hot water if he keeps pushing her buttons. Feeling humiliated, Saiwook decides to cut his losses and walk away. He tries to find his girlfriend, but she claims she doesn't know him. People in the stadium start whispering about him, saying they'd deny knowing him too if they were his girlfriend. Saiwook's anger builds to the point where he's ready for a showdown, but John steps in with a final warning. Sunga tells John she didn't know he had that side to him. But John apologizes, expressing regret for ever introducing Saiwook to his sister. He admits Saiwook's behavior was inexcusable and emphasizes his remorse. He then checks on Sunga and others to make sure they're okay. Later, as Saiwook is leaving, he's still fuming about what Sunga did to him at the game. He hears someone call his name and turns around to see Jean. He asks her if she came alone or with her brother and Sunga. Jean answers him sternly, saying that he means nothing to her. She insists she has nothing to say to him and no feelings for him, so he should stop trying to talk to her. If they happen to run into each other, he should just keep walking. With that, she leaves, and Saiwook is left feeling rejected. In the bathroom, Saiwook tries to scrub the stains off his pants, but they won't budge. He's furious and can't believe they humiliated him like that. He starts thinking about how he can get back at them. He doesn't know much about Sunga, but he does know where Jean lives. He also notes that Jean seems to have found herself some bodyguards. 
While he's talking to himself, someone walks into the bathroom and asks him what he's planning to do to Jean. Saiwook looks up and sees it's Waiho. He tells Saiwook he's been looking for him. Waiho can't help but think back to when he first met Saiwook, and a pang of regret hits him. He wishes he'd stepped up earlier, before Saiwook could mess with Jin's head. As he's lost in thought, Saiwook notices Waiho's bag and can't help but wonder if there's a baseball tucked inside. He challenges Waiho, asking what he's up to, especially considering his celebrity status. Saiwook even threatens him, saying he could make a big fuss and turn Waiho's personal life into tabloid fodder. But Waiho just shrugs it off, telling Saiwook his career is rock solid and he's not worried about his threats. To break the tension, he suggests they play a simple game loser gets a flick on the forehead. Saiwook, feeling confident, agrees to the challenge. But, as luck would have it, Saiwook loses the game and receives the flick from Waiho, sending him sprawling to the ground. Standing tall, Waiho advises Saiwook to steer clear of him in the future. Meanwhile, Jean is a bundle of nerves after standing up to her ex. She feels a mix of fear and relief, but her legs are shaking so much she can barely stand. Just as she's about to topple over, Waiho swoops in, catching her before she hits the ground. Surprised, she asks him why he's here when he's not scheduled to play. He simply extends his hand to help her up, but she politely declines. Waiho catches her eye and wonders aloud why she'd come to a baseball game with her brother, John. As they start walking, Waiho notices that Jin's still shaking. Worried, he reaches for her hand to steady her, assuring her he'll take her to find John. He then asks her if she's seen the video of her brother at a Futures game and wonders aloud if John thinks he can just switch teams like that. Jean, grateful for Waiho's support, leans on him even though it feels a bit strange to her. She smiles, telling him she's not scared anymore. Waiho's looking at Jean, trying to figure out why she's here. He's stoked to see her and lets her know he'd been thinking about giving her a ring. But, you know, didn't want to bug her or anything. Jean teases him, saying he's acting all high school again, babbling whenever he gets nervous. Suddenly, Waiho changes gears and says he wants to chat about some stuff that went down recently. Jean turns beet red, but before they can dive into it, Sunga pops up out of nowhere and gives Jean a big bear hug. She tells Jean she'd been hunting for her all over. Sunga then clocks Waiho and asks who this dude is and how he knows her little angel, that's Jean. Jean introduces Waiho as a buddy of her brother, a baseball star, and an all-around good egg. That's when Sunga gets this weird feeling like she's seen Waiho before. She racks her brain and realizes he's the guy from the restaurant where she gave him a 3.9 out of 5 for looks. Yikes! That comment sets off a whole bunch of misunderstandings. Fast forward a bit, and they're all sitting in a restaurant, getting ready to chow down. But it's kinda awkward, and no one's saying much. John breaks the silence, asking Sunga if she and Waiho have some history. Waiho starts to explain, but John cuts him off, saying he wasn't asking him. Jean jumps in, asking if Sunga is the girl Waiho said he was with that night. Waiho admits it was her and says he's sorry. Jean thanks him for being straight up about it. Waiho also tells Jean that things didn't go as far as they could have with Sunga. Sunga backs him up, saying she's used to baseball players trying to score with her, but nothing happened with Waiho. Jean takes a moment to think about it all. She realizes Sunga's been cool to her, even though they just met. And Waiho was telling the truth about the night he met a hot girl who then kicked him out. So, from Jin's point of view, things are looking up. Sunga laughs about how small their world is, and how they're all connected in some way. She suggests they get out of the restaurant, lightening the mood with a little joke. Next scene, Waiho and Jean are cruising in a car, and Waiho's trying to chat her up. But Jin's not having any of it. He tries a softer approach, reaching out to touch her hand, but she pulls back quicker than a cat on a hot tin roof. She tells him they can talk later, just not right now. Now, let's switch gears to another vehicle where John and Sunga are riding. Sunga's yawning like it's going out of style, looking all kinds of tired. John clocks this and suggests she catch some ZS on his shoulder. Just as he's about to say something else, Sunga slaps her hand over his mouth, afraid he's gonna call her master even though she's a bit buzzed. This is a first for John, seeing her let loose like this, and he thinks it's pretty cute. He admits he's never had these feelings before and maybe that's why he was bummed hearing about Waiho and Sunga. 
He says he felt kinda hurt, even though he knows there's nothing between them. Fast forward to when they get to their destination. John says he's gonna head home, but Sangha wants to know why. He starts stumbling over his words, and she thinks he's upset about their team losing. Then, she reaches for his hand, asking if it's because she almost hooked up with his buddy. He pulls away and apologizes. Sangha then drops a truth bomb, saying she's all about honesty, even if it's a bit awkward. She could have sugar-coated things, but that would have felt like lying. She admits it was a bit embarrassing confessing she almost hooked up with his friend, but she hates lying. She gets that John's upset, but they've only known each other for a hot minute. So, she suggests they take a break and bids him goodbye. But just as she hops in the elevator, John rushes over, trying to stop the doors from closing. He tells her they should go to the game together tomorrow. Then, out of nowhere, he says he's hers and calls her master. Sangha, taken aback, pulls him in and plants one on him, accepting his offer. They finally get to their room after a long day, and Sangha announces she's going to primp a bit. John's left alone, and he seizes the chance to practice calling her by her first name. He's feeling a bit goofy doing this, considering they've been hanging out non-stop for two days, but his heart's still doing the samba when he thinks about her. Sangha emerges from the bathroom, looking fresh as a daisy, only to find John snoozed out. She grins at him, thinking he must be beat from all the day's drama. She tries to shimmy him into a more comfy spot on the bed before heading to the mini bar to grab a drink and hit the sack herself. But then, plot twist. John rolls over just as she's coming back, and her drink takes a nosedive right onto him. She notices he's also drenched in sweat. She attempts to strip him down to dry him off, but the guy's dead weight. She tells him she's not trying anything funny, just helping him get to bed. As she's explaining, he grabs her hand. She quickly tells him not to get the wrong idea, she just spilled her drink on him and was going to send his clothes to the cleaners. But now that he's awake, he can handle it himself. Then, out of the blue, John asks if they can get a little cozy again. Sangha plants a smooch on him and says she's game, but only if he's calling the shots this time. To her surprise, he's totally on board. Meanwhile, Jean and Waiho have just hopped out of their ride. Waiho tries to pick up where they left off earlier, but Jean puts a pin in it, saying she's wiped out. She walks off, leaving him in her dust. As she strolls away, she can't help but wonder why she's acting so weird, especially since she insists she doesn't give a hoot. Ever since she heard about the almost happened romance between him and Sangha, she can't shake off the image of them together. She's kicking herself for not talking it out with him sooner. Now that she's alone, she can't seem to shut off her brain. Suddenly, Waiho catches up to her, saying he's not letting her walk away without finishing their chat. Meanwhile, after a good time together, John and Sangha finally get real with each other. John admits he's got the hots for Sangha, and she reciprocates, saying she's been feeling the same way. In the meantime, Waiho and Jean are still trying to figure out where to have their heart to heart. Waiho kicks things off by saying sorry to Jean. He knows that he messed up big time that night and that she might not ever forgive him. He gets that no amount of I'm sorry is going to fix the damage done. He tells her he was feeling super low that night. Waiho then starts reminiscing about the day he bumped into Sangha at the cafe. He was at a baseball game, all set to play when his coach pulled him aside. Just as he was about to hit the field, the coach called Juwa to play instead. Turns out, Waiho was only there to sub in if someone on base needed to be replaced. The crowd started buzzing, speculating if Juwa was the coach's son since he always got chosen to play. After the game, the coach dropped a bombshell on Waiho, telling him he was being sent back to the minor league dorms. He even gave Waiho some money because there wasn't a game the next day. The coach stressed that if Waiho wanted to get back to the majors, he needed to up his game. As Waiho was leaving, Juwa pretended to say goodbye but ended up mocking him. He even suggested that Waiho should cozy up to the boss's daughter to get back into the major league. Feeling bummed and regretting not taking action sooner, Waiho walked away and ended up at a cafe, where he decided to drown his sorrows. Now, Waiho is explaining all this to Jean. But Jean throws a curveball, accusing him of intending to sleep with Sangha but ending up sleeping with her instead. She even suggests they should do it again. Waiho is stunned by this proposal and offers to take Jean home, thinking she might be feeling cold. 
Jean, regretting her words, rushes to her room in tears. Waiho blames himself for Jin's harsh words and carries that guilt all night. The next morning, Sumba wakes up, wrapped in a blanket. She wonders why John tucked her in like this. He tells her he didn't want her to catch a cold and that he wouldn't mind waking up to this scene more often. We also find out that Sunga has some quirky sleeping habits. Sunga's running her fingers over her lips, and it jolts John awake. She tells him she's tacked on a few more days to their stay cause she's beat and needs to recharge. This sends John into flashback mode, replaying the previous night's events in his head. He starts to freak out, thinking he might have hurt Sunga during their steamy rendezvous. After some serious pondering, he decides to spill a secret he's been holding on to. Taking a deep breath, he admits he isn't exactly cheering for the Futures team. But before he can explain himself, Sunga cuts him off, saying she's not a fan either. She vents about how frustrating it is to support a team that hasn't seen a win in 20 years and why anyone would root for a pitcher who can't throw a ball. While she's ranting, John tries to set the record straight. After her tirade, Sunga asks for John's number. Even though she's key to her team, she suggests they watch games together. She playfully leans in and says they should help the team start winning again. Then, out of nowhere, Sunga comments on how buff John is. She reminds him that she extended their stay, making her intentions clear. Later, as they're about to head out for the game, John feels like it's the perfect time to come clean. But just as he's about to spill the beans, it starts pouring rain. They make a mad dash for Sunga's car to escape the downpour. Once they're inside the car, Sunga asks for John's address, offering to drop him home. But he turns her down, asking to be dropped off at the subway station instead. Sunga respects his decision and tells him he's the first guy who's ever made her feel this way. As they're heading to the station, John's deep in thought, carrying the weight of his secret. Meanwhile, Sunga wishes the weather had been better for the game. Before they part ways, she suggests he bring his sister to the next game and gives him a big bear hug. When John gets home, he notices it's unusually quiet. He finds Jean there, looking a bit out of sorts and fiddling with her phone as if it's on the fritz. John becomes worried about his sister. She keeps brushing him off, saying she's fine and just needs to get a hold of someone on her phone. She's got this hunch that her phone's busted because Waiho hasn't hit her up since their last blow up. She's afraid that whatever was brewing between them is kaput before it even really kicked off. Then, out of nowhere, her phone lights up. She picks up, and the voice on the other end starts firing questions at her. Meanwhile, Sunga's pulling up at Jin's place to scoop her up. Jean hops in, apologizing for flaking on their previous plans and complimenting Sunga on her new do. Sunga can tell Jin's wound up tight, but she's doing a good job hiding it. Jean suggests they head to a cafe for a chat, but Sunga's more into the idea of hanging at the ballpark. Cut to Waiho, who's busy knocking baseballs out of the park and trying to unwind. Fast forward to the stadium, where Jin's struggling to get a word in edgewise because of all the noise. But Sung is insistent on having their heart-to-heart -heart right there in the bleachers. She starts dropping some truth bombs about Jin's feelings for Waiho, and after a while, Jin starts feeling a bit better. She decides it's time to track down Waiho. Back home, John's pacing, waiting for Jin to get back. He tries calling her, but she's not picking up. He starts thinking maybe her phone really is on the fritz this time. Now, Jin's on a mission to find Waiho, so she dials his number. As soon as he picks up, he starts babbling apologies, not even letting her get a word in. He tells her he needed some alone time to sort things out, but he's ready to give her what she wants now. Jean tells him she's at the stadium and suggests they meet up outside. But Waiho breaks it to her that he's actually at home, not the stadium. He promises he'll get there as fast as he can. When he finally shows up, he gives her a hard time for waiting outside in the cold. Jean starts apologizing and lets it all hang out, telling him how she really feels. She admits she's scared and jealous, but she's also totally into him. She tells him she'll give him all the time he needs to figure things out, then turns to leave. Waiho, touched by her honesty, catches up to her and wraps her up in a hug. He tells her he's feeling the same way about her and thanks her for being real with him. They both start tearing up, and he teases her about being a crybaby. Since it's getting late, Waiho invites her over to crash at his place. 
He says sorry for the mess and promises not to pull any funny business. After Jean freshens up, Waiho hands her a brand new pillow and offers her the bed while he hits the floor. But Jean wants him up there with her, saying she wants to hold his hand as she falls asleep. As he climbs into bed next to her, she asks if he's really only planning on holding her hand, hinting that she might be up for a little more action. Later, Jin's all curled up in bed, deep in dreamland, and her dreams are playing like a movie reel of old memories. But Waiho, being the sweetheart that he is, gently wakes her up. He tells her he had a dream about her. She's surprised and admits she did too. He gives her a good morning kiss and they both get up to start their day. They head to the bathroom, and Jean asks if he's not running late for practice. Waiho glances at his watch and immediately drops his toothbrush. He reminds her to grab some breakfast before heading out and apologizes for not having time to whip something up for her. But before he could leave, Jean stops him with a kiss. She asks if she can hang out at his place on his off days, now that she's officially his girlfriend. Waiho pulls her into a tight hug and promises to call her as soon as he's done with practice. As he's bounding down the stairs, he can't help but think about how crazy he is about Jean. He grins, thinking about how they're officially a couple now. Meanwhile, Jin's still in bed lost in thought. Suddenly, she remembers she forgot to thank Sunga. She wonders if Sunga's at the stadium again and thinks about how much of a baseball nut she is. That's probably why she and John hit it off so well. She also wonders if Sunga knows that her brother, John, is actually an Anne's fan. Jean decides to give John a call. He picks up and starts grilling her about where she stayed the night. He tells her he had to cover for her with their parents. Jean spills the beans and tells him she's at her boyfriend's place. John's taken aback and stammers, your boyfriend? She promises to give him the lowdown later and asks if he's confessed to Sunga about only cheering for the futures because of their deal. He admits he hasn't but plans on doing so today. He confesses that he should have told her sooner and feels awful for lying. While still on the call, Jean can tell John's stressed out. She starts thinking it'll be her fault if Sunga doesn't take the news well. She apologizes to John, saying she shouldn't have taken her frustration out on him or dragged Sunga into it. But John, being the awesome big bro that he is, tells her not to worry and that he'll talk to Sunga first. After hanging up, he decides to be totally honest with Sunga from now on. It's game day again, and the future's victory are squaring off against the wannabe ants. John's in the stadium, nervously waiting for Sunga. He's decided to come clean as soon as he sees her. Finally, she shows up, asking why he didn't wait for her. He apologizes, saying he felt bad like he was taking advantage. She notices he's not in his uniform and reminds him they need to win today. He apologizes again, thinking how he couldn't exactly tell her he's not a Futures fan while wearing a Futures uniform. She settles into her seat, already cheering for her team, when John suddenly tells her he has something important to say. He tries to brush it off for a sec, but then he remembers that lying ain't his thing. So, he sucks it up and starts to tell her. She's looking at him like he's grown an extra head or something, trying to figure out what's up with his weird face. John takes a deep breath and spills the beans, he admits he's been playing her and he's actually cheering for the ants. But the place is so noisy she can't hear a word he's saying. She reads his lips though and wishes she hadn't. His confession triggers some bad memories about her dad, and she hates liars cause of him. She starts thinking about all the fun times she had with John and wonders why these memories are popping up now. Even though she can't stand liars, she grabs John by his shirt and plants one right on his lips. She thought if she could just pretend she didn't hear him, maybe he'd play along. She just wants things to stay the way they were. The other fans start recognizing them from that viral kiss cam video. Some dude yells out that they should get a room and that this isn't some cheesy rom-com where the team wins because they smooch. But they don't care and keep going at it. John wonders if Sunga didn't catch what he said earlier, but she just gets back to the game and insists they keep cheering. Inside, she's telling herself she just wants baseball, kisses, and sleepovers with John, no strings attached. She decides she's not gonna let herself fall for him too hard, cause that only leads to disappointment, just like in baseball. When the game ends and the future's victory takes home the win, Sunga's over the moon. John tries to bring up their earlier chat, but she cuts him off and suggests they hit up a hotel. 
She tells him she had a blast watching the game with him and since they won, they should keep up their good luck routine. Then, she turns to him and asks if they can spend the night together. John's torn between telling her the truth and worrying about how she'll react. Later that night, she starts talking about the game and John wonders if she really didn't hear what he confessed earlier. He tries to bring it up again, but she interrupts him to compliment his hand. Suddenly, her phone rings. John asks who it could be at this hour, but she just picks up the phone and walks towards the window. It seems like she's having a heated conversation with whoever's on the other end, and John's just sitting there, nervously wringing his hands. After she hangs up, he calls out her name, totally shocked by her outburst. John tries to get the scoop from Sunga and wants to know if she's okay. But she's all like, let's just hit the hay. They bunk down for the night and Sunga's dreams start to play out like a bad rerun of her childhood. She's seeing flashbacks of how her pops, who she thought was a stand-up guy, totally betrayed her. It's like she's reliving the day she found out about her so-called real family. Even though it's been years, that memory is as fresh as a daisy in her mind. It's like her nightmares are hell-bent on making sure she never forgets. As she's tossing and turning, she rolls into John's arms. She's mumbling something about never forgetting the pain and humiliation of finding out her dad, who she thought was single, already had a family. She's going on about how he acted like letting her in on his real family was some kind of favor. All this has left her with a serious grudge against liars, and now, whenever she smells a lie, she totally loses it. All she wants is to never feel that kind of pain again. When she wakes up the next morning, she's still in John's arms. He asks if she slept okay, but she says she had a nightmare. Just as she's about to get up and freshen up, John starts pouring out his heart. He confesses that he's been lying to her. He tells her that he only started cheering for the futures because his sister made him do it. She had asked him to switch teams as payback for setting her up with her ex. All this time, he's actually been an aunt's fan. Sunga's just sitting there, taking it all in, wondering if she's going to cut him loose over this. She's thinking to herself that supporting a different baseball team is nothing compared to cheating, but it doesn't change the fact that both John and her dad lied to her. She starts wishing she hadn't fallen for him so hard, maybe then it wouldn't hurt so much. After a long pause, she starts talking about how there were times when she wanted to end it all. But baseball was the one thing that kept her going. It was like her escape from reality. To her, cheering for the team that literally saved her life wasn't a joke. But John immediately starts apologizing and begging for forgiveness. She cuts him off and tells him to save it. She doesn't want to hear another word from him and tells him to scram. Sunga kicks John out of the room, telling him she's done with their convo. But the guy just won't quit, he keeps saying sorry even from outside. Later that day, Jean spots her bro heading home looking all gloomy and stuff. She can't help but wonder if something went down. As John's about to hit the shower, he can't help but replay the day's drama in his head. He feels like crap, thinking how Sunga has every right to feel betrayed. He started this whole thing as a joke, but he ended up lying about something that means the world to her. He's feeling guilty, wondering if she's eaten or if she's gonna watch the game alone. He remembers her asking him to watch all the games with her and he feels even worse for breaking that promise. While Jin's waiting for him to finish up in the shower, she's feeling bad about the whole mess. The moment he steps out, she rushes over and starts saying sorry. She's even thinking about going to Sunga herself to clear things up. But John's like, it's not your fault, sis. He tells her he's the one who kept lying when he had so many chances to come clean. So, he pats her on the head and tells her not to worry, he'll be fine. After that, he just flops onto his bed, wondering if it's really over between him and Sunga. He thinks about calling her to say sorry properly and tell her all the things he didn't get to say. He grabs his phone, not sure if she'll pick up, and dials her number. But all he gets is a number unreachable message. He figures the game's probably started by now, so he flips on the TV, hoping to catch a glimpse of her. He hears some other fans talking about him and Sunga not being at the game and how their lucky kiss always leads to a team win. Meanwhile, Sunga's at her place, watching the game when John's call comes in. But she's not having it. She drops the phone and keeps watching. The next morning, John wakes up with a start. 
He realizes Sangha didn't pick up his calls probably because the futures lost yesterday. He thinks about calling her again but remembers that she loves her sleep and might still be snoozing. So, he decides to man up and do whatever it takes to make things right. He even promises himself to always look sharp cause he never knows when he might run into her. He figures the best place to bump into her is at the stadium. So, he heads there, hoping to see her. But she's a no-show. After the game, he can't help but wonder if she's given up on baseball, even though she once said it was the only thing that kept her going. Now, he's feeling all guilty again, plus he really misses her. In the next scene, Sung is chilling at a cafe, waiting for Jean to show up. When Jean finally makes an entrance, she starts apologizing for dragging her away from the game. But Sung is like, nah, it's all good. The stadium would have been too noisy, plus I'm not really into going there these days. Just as Jin's about to say sorry again, Sunga switches gears and asks her how things are going with her boyfriend. Jean takes a moment to thank Sunga for helping her out the other day. She even gives her a little bow and starts saying sorry again. But Sunga cuts her off, telling her to drop the apologies. She admits she was kinda worried she might have given Jean some bad advice since relationships can be such a maze. But she's relieved things worked out for Jean. Then, Jean drops the bombshell about John switching teams because of her. She explains how she had just been dumped and was super pissed at John for rubbing his team's win in her face. She feels awful about the whole thing and keeps saying sorry. As Sunga listens to Jean, she starts thinking that it's just baseball, not a crime to switch teams. She appreciates how both Jean and John have been so understanding and apologetic. She thinks they're pretty cool for feeling guilty over something most people would laugh off. Sunga then opens up about how she's still dealing with some stuff from her past. She admits that she sometimes overreacts when people touch on those sensitive topics. She thanks Jean for being so sweet and hands her a tissue for her teary eyes. She tells Jean she needs some time to sort through her feelings. So, after their heart-to-heart -heart at the cafe, Sunga insists on giving Jean a lift home. She's a bit worried about her going solo, especially since she's been crying. But Jin's all like, I'm good, really. Just then, Waiho shows up and Sangha feels a bit relieved knowing Jean won't be alone. So, she hops in her car and drives off. Waiho checks in with Jean, asking if she got everything off her chest. She nods, and he figures it's just a waiting game now. Trying to lighten the mood, he offers to walk her home. On her way home, Sunga gets a call from John. She pulls over, stares at her phone for a bit, then decides not to pick up. Just as she's about to drive off, a text from John pops up. She starts questioning herself, wondering what she needs this time for. Back at his place, John's bummed that Sunga didn't pick up, but he's a bit relieved she didn't block him. He figures he'll just keep trying and hopefully, she'll answer one day. Fast forward a few weeks, and the baseball season's almost over. The futures started off strong, but they've slipped back into their old losing streak. People are all over the place, some saying I told you so, others expressing their disappointment. As for Sangha and John, it's the same old story. She's still ignoring his calls, and he's still rooting for the futures, hoping he'll bump into her at one of the games. To him, it's like playing baseball. He knows he might strike out, but he's still stepping up to the plate, hoping for a home run. Fast forward to early October, it's the last game of the season between the wannabe ants and the future's victory. John heads to the stadium, thinking maybe, just maybe, this'll be the game where he runs into Sangha. As he walks in, he's reminded of their past conversations and can't help but tear up. But he decides not to throw in the towel just yet. The game's not over, and she might still show up. His sis, Jean, finds him and asks about Sunga. He brushes her off, saying they need to get to their seats. Once they're seated, Jean wonders how he scored tickets to such a packed game. He tells her that Waiho hooked him up. Just then, Jean spots her boyfriend among the players and starts to cheer, but stops herself, worried she'll jinx his team. John reassures her, saying Waiho's been doing great and might even get to play later in the game. Meanwhile, some wannabe Ants fans are huddled in a corner, talking smack about the future's victory. They're all like, can't believe these losers have fans, and they're even sitting in our section. They keep going on about how the futures are trash and even drag Sunga into their convo. 
They start calling her names, saying she's probably not even into baseball, but just crushing on the players. John overhears them and steps in, asking what they're yapping about. He tells them off, saying they shouldn't trash talk people they don't know. But these guys are a piece of work. They tell him to butt out and mind his own business. John's not having any of it, though. He warns them to stop badmouthing people, but it only makes things worse. Other fans start noticing the commotion. Meanwhile, at the cafe, a young girl asks Sunga why she's not at the game, even though she's streaming it on her phone. Sunga's all fired up about her team losing, but then she spots John about to throw down with some dude at the stadium. The girl can't believe people get so worked up over baseball. Back at the stadium, John's still telling the guy to apologize. But the guy's looking for a fight. A staff member steps in, warning them to cool it or he'll have to kick them out. John's furious, but he knows he can't let it escalate. So, he gives the guy a hard handshake and sits back down. Gene whispers to him that he did the right thing, but John still feels bad for causing a scene. She reassures him that she was mad too and believes Sunga will show up. As the game continues, Jean gets all teary-eyed watching Waiho play. She's over the moon, but John's a bundle of nerves. He's stoked about Waiho scoring, but he's worried that if the Futures don't win, Sunga might not show up. Then, out of the blue, he spots her in the crowd. He's about to go over when he loses sight of her. He wonders if he was just seeing things. The two wannabe Ants fans start their trash talk again, saying the Futures winning today doesn't change the fact they're still the worst team in the league. One of them even makes a snide remark about not wanting to offend any Futures fans. Jin's had enough and tells them to shut it. But they keep going, suggesting the Futures should change their name to Future Losers. Sunga's voice cuts through the chatter, dropping a subtle warning to the hecklers. John jumps, startled, and starts babbling about needing to talk. But Sangha's not having it. She insists they bounce, not wanting to entertain those goons. So, they sneak off to some quieter spot. Sangha tells John she saw him on TV, scrapping with some aunt's fan. She's got her suspicions, but she wants to hear it from him. She asks if he's been picking fights and wearing the uniform because of her. After all, she knows he's not the type to throw punches over a losing team. She's touched that even after she pushed him away, he kept trying without pressuring her. She gives him the okay to spill his guts, and to her surprise, he confesses his love. She was expecting an apology, but what she really wanted were the words that follow I'm sorry from her dad back then and now from John. He apologizes for getting emotional, but Sangha teases him, saying his tears freak her out. Then, she pulls him in for a kiss. As they lock lips, she hopes for a miracle like when they first met. But she soon realizes that their time for miracles is over. But hey, their love story is just starting. Back at the stadium, the game's heating up. Jin's eyes are glued to Waiho, her heart pounding as his team wins the game. She's crying happy tears, while the Futures fans look like they've lost their puppy. Sunga, a die-hard Futures fan, thinks her team should just quit baseball after yet another defeat. She confesses to John that baseball is her life, but it ticks her off sometimes. John tries to lift her spirits, reminding her that there's always a next season and they'll do better. He tells her to remember the saying, it's not over till it's over. Suddenly, Jean runs over to them, her face lit up like a Christmas tree. Sunga invites her to join them for grub, but Jean just wants to head home after congratulating Waiho. Jean asks about Sunga and John, and Sunga admits that they've decided to start dating. Jin's surprised, but she's happy for them and believes they're perfect for each other. Their moment is interrupted by the cheers of the wannabe players celebrating Waiho's insane catch that won them the game. As he's about to leave, he pulls out a picture of Jean from his hat and stares at it. How adorable! He's totally head over heels for her. Later that day, John and Sunga are having dinner at a local joint. John leans in, asking how she's been. Sunga takes a moment to reflect, thinking about all the texts he sent when she was feeling alone. She recalls how each one felt like a warm hug on a cold day. She even remembers freaking out when a text came late because he overslept, and questioning why it mattered so much to her. Snapping back from her thoughts, she looks at John and says she's been just like him. He admits he really missed her and hoped she was doing okay. 
He starts to ask if he can hold her hand, but before he can finish, she's already reaching out. As he takes her hand, he promises to keep her smiling. As their food arrives, John blushes, and Sunda teases him about his newfound love for soup all thanks to her. He admits she's got him hooked on some seriously good grub. But before he can finish, she tells him nothing tastes better than his love. His jaw drops, but she quickly clarifies she meant his love is sweet. But truth be told, John was right with his first guess. She invites him over to her place after dinner, to show him around and maybe even spend the night. Fast forward a bit, and the wannabe ants win the league, marking the end of the fall season. Baseball's off-season begins. Next up, we see Jean waiting for Waiho. When he finally shows up, she gives him a big hug, causing quite a stir among the bystanders. Jean tries to pull away, but Waiho holds her hand and tells her they're just acting like any other couple. She used to think winter was a lonely season, but not anymore. Seasons come and go, but things always heat up in the end, just like in baseball and love. Now we're at Sunda's place, with John stepping in for the first time. He feels like he should have brought something, but she reassures him that he's not empty-handed. Seems she loves teasing him. She offers him a seat and goes to grab some drinks. As they chill, Sunda tells him he's the first person to visit her place aside from her mom. She's been living there alone for years, but now that he's there, everything feels different, more fun. John thanks her for inviting him over and says he's loving getting to know her better. You know that point when you're hanging out, and you realize the other person's already tipsy? Yeah, that's where Sunda finds herself with John. His face is flushed, and his heart's racing like he just ran a marathon. So, she cozies up to him and asks him what's up. She tells him that she invited him over to talk really talk. She realized while they were apart that she didn't know much about him. All her memories were either of them getting intimate or about baseball, and it kinda bummed her out. Don't get her wrong, those memories are great, but she wants more. She wants to get to know him, touch him, feel his touch, because, well, she loves him. And then, in a smooth move, she suggests they take their chat to the bedroom. Once they're in the bedroom, things heat up pretty quick. Afterward, they confess their love for each other, and Sunga realizes she now knows what love is. She's sure as hell he loves her too. After a refreshing shower, John keeps asking if she's okay. She laughs and tells him to stop worrying and join her. As they cuddle, he drops the news, he got a job. He won't be able to attend all the games next season. He explains he graduated and has been job hunting. His parents are teachers, so he thought he'd follow suit, but after meeting Sunga, he found his true calling. Sunga is taken aback, she knows so little about him. John elaborates that he'll be a bodyguard for the futures and will work only on home games. He even jokes about being her personal bodyguard one day. But before he can finish, Sunga flips him over. The thought of him as her bodyguard got her all excited, and well, it's time for another round. Fast forward two months later, and Waiho and Jean are out on a date. It's clear Waiho's gotten pretty famous, and Jin's having second thoughts about holding hands in public. As they watch their movie, Jean can't help but stare at him, he's hot, and he's hers. Suddenly, she realizes everyone's looking at him. She subtly brushes her fingers against his, earning a quick peck from him. After the movie, they walk back in awkward silence until Waiho mentions her surprise move. She grins and admits she did it because everyone was staring. Then, her stomach growls, and Waiho suggests they grab dinner. At the restaurant, Jean compliments Waiho's grilling skills. He laughs and says it's probably the only thing he's good at. Seeing her reaction, he quickly explains he used to cook meat for the team dinners. He sucked at first, but after some tough love from his teammates, he got better. Practice makes perfect, he concludes. Jin's not exactly thrilled with Waiho's self-deprecating comment. She quickly sets him straight, reminding him that she fell head over heels for him watching him play baseball. She tells him that no one shines brighter than him on the field and he better not talk himself down again. After successfully shutting down his modesty, Waiho casually brags about his mad grilling skills. Jean cheerfully agrees but playfully adds a condition, from now on, he's only grilling for her. After dinner, Waiho offers to call a cab to take her home. 
But something in her eyes makes him pause and ask if she's still upset about his earlier comment. Jean shakes her head and, gathering her courage, asks if she can stay over at his place. She's hoping they can have some alone time, and after dropping this bombshell, she saunters off, feeling pretty pleased with herself. Fast forward to them at his place, and Wai Ho keeps insisting she can change her mind about staying over. But Jean silences him with a reassuring touch on his arm and decides to take charge. Wai Ho tries to bring up a conversation, but Jean playfully shuts him up. She wants to return the favor for all the times he's made her feel good. Wai Ho is delighted but insists she shouldn't do anything she's uncomfortable with. Later, Jean brings up how everyone was staring at him at the movie theater. But Wai Ho denies it, saying he couldn't take his eyes off her. She calls him out, but he insists he was so focused on her he doesn't even remember the movie they watched. Eventually, Jean drifts off to sleep during their chat, and Wai Ho gives her a gentle forehead kiss before joining her. Fast forward through the seasons, and despite all the world's troubles trying to tear them apart, Sunga and John manage to stick together. It's spring again, and it's time for the opening game between the future's victory and the wannabe ants. John, his sister, and his girlfriend are all there, ready to cheer on their team. John asks if Waiho is starting, and Sunga jokes that, of course, he is, after his killer performance last season. But she quickly adds not to get too confident because her team is gunning for the fall games this year. Just then, Waiho pops by to say hi to Jean and asks her to cheer for him. In the end, Sunga and John stick to their mantra, it's not over till it's over. Despite the many hurdles they faced, their love persevered. Meanwhile, Jean finally finds the true love she's always longed for. And with that, this beautiful story comes to an end. Please let us know in the comments if you enjoyed this story and want more like this. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao!